Do you have any regrets? Do you have any regrets? I hope they're not sitting beside you, but I hope you don't. I hope you have some, because all of us have a little bit, right? All of us have a little bit of regret in our life. I, I, I can remember, oh, obviously through these years, there have been a number of people that um, that have died in the course of my time in the ministry, and there's probably been at least eight or ten occasions where I. I had a suspicion or an intuition or something. Something was prodding me. Hey, Kyle, you need to go see this person. And I went, uh, not today. And they ended up dying before I could go see them. So that's happened more times than I, than I, than I want to admit. But every time I've had those, you know, probably a prompting from God, truthfully, go see this person. And I somehow come up with an excuse not to do it. And then, boom, that, the person dies unexpectedly or a little bit quicker than, than, than I was expecting. And I was going like, God, you tried to tell me. <laughs> you tried to tell me, and I just made it. So I've had, I've had some of those regrets in, in my life. Uh, and because of, of recent deaths we've had in our church and then a fraternity brother of mine whose father just died, I started thinking about the regrets with my father. And, and those regrets happened because... Those, my last years that, looking back, that would have been my last years with him, my sophomore year, uh, junior, high school, uh, senior year, and then my freshman year of college, I, those were times I got, you know, busy into the things that I wanted to do. Uh, I was, you know, baseball band, just being in school or whatever, and then, then first year at Auburn, just got real busy, and, and I didn't have a lot of time that I remember looking back that I spent with my father that were just me and him hanging out for whatever reason or talking or whatever. It just you know, it wasn't, it wasn't much in his makeup anyway to do a whole lot of talking. Uh, he left that up, up to my mom. Uh, but but I, just, I just regret not having those times where I could just even spend a few minutes with him or tell him I love him. So, so I, ha- I have those regrets. And then there's a regret that happened that I, have, that I still regret to this day. It happened, I think it was summer of 87, Pretty sure that was, I was getting ready to um, go to to uh, grad school, and I was I was working in a church north of Birmingham, and and there was a girl that I was hanging out with pretty regularly or whatever, and come down to the end of the summer, and I was getting ready to leave, whatever, and I had a conversation with her. It didn't go real well. I made some comments that were hurtful and demeaning to her. Uh, that in retrospect and the letter that I got later that, were, that said what you said was very hurtful. And so I, I regretted that conversation. I regretted having that conversation to, to make this young girl feel so bad. And I think it was a year or two later, I was, she was at, at the time, then, then she was at University of Alabama. I was coming back from Kentucky, headed to my brother's house uh, on the west side of Alabama. And I just pulled through I pulled off and made a phone call. This is before cell phones. I made a phone call to see if I could catch her and do a face-to-face uh, meeting with her and apologize because it was, still was weighing on me a little bit then. And she didn't answer. I left a voicemail. And then even, even with the advent of Facebook, I've still not been able to find this person, uh, truthfully, because no idea. I got married and all this other stuff. I have no idea. I can't, can't find her. So I have, I've lived with that regret for, for my whole life. Just because just the way I left things and the, and, and the hurt that, that I'd caused. What regrets do you have? Now, we're going to show a clip today that, that asks us about regrets, that sort of reminds us about regrets, but it's from a movie I do not endorse. Can I, can I, can I make that clear? Okay? It's from a movie I do not endorse. It's not a family oriented movie. Do not watch it with your family. Okay, if you watch it, watch it by yourself so you will not be embarrassed. Okay, that's my disclaimer. I got burned on this a number of years ago. I've been reminded of it ever since. All right, so somebody watched a film that, uh, that I showed a clip of and, and embarrassed them and, with their 11 year old, 12 year old daughter. Anyway, so I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to make a disclaimer. It's okay to watch Frozen, Frozen 2. But this next clip, I'm not endorsing it, but I love the clip. Watch. What's up, dog? Not much, dog. What's up with you? I'm here to pick up Casey, you know what I'm saying? What's your name, man? Scotty P, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) 
Well, I'm awake and I speak English, so yeah, I do know what you're saying. Hi. Bye. We're gonna go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where do you think you're going? Would you please have a seat? Hey, those are cool tats, man. Oh, for real. Thank you, bro. You yeah. see the cobra? Hey, what is this one? Oh, this? Uh-huh. That's my credo. No regrets. Mm-hmm. You have no regrets? Dad? No. Nope. Like, not even a single letter? No, no. way. <laughs> not me. Well, I love them. All right. All right, we... Sometimes we regret the things that we do. We regret um, choices that we make. We tr regret people that we have hurt. Uh, we have re regret broken promises. We regret cheating, we, some of those things. We also regret, like I said, some of the things I, we don't do. You know, we, we didn't spend enough time with a family member. We didn't save enough money. We didn't, we didn't plan enough. So we all have different regrets. In Frozen 2, there, there's actually, the whole kingdom has a regret, okay? If you want to, want to put it in that frame, framework, there's something that has happened that is regrettable, a regrettable circumstance in the past for Arendelle. And in this movie, things start popping up really weird in their country. It's, uh, it's earth, wind, and fire in September. No, wait, wait a second. That's a, that, no, it's earth, wind, and fire and water. And things start to happen. People have to leave their country, go to the cliffs. And uh, Elsa and Anna, I had to pronounce it correctly. I've been saying Anna for a while, but it's Anna. Elsa and Anna uh, get the people together, give them some information, but they don't know the whole story until the troll comes along and gives them sort of really the direction for the rest of this movie. Watch. I hope you're prepared for what you have done, Elsa. Angry magical spirits are not for the faint of heart. Why are they still angry? What does all of this have to do with Arendelle? Let me see what I can see. The past is not what it seems. A wrong demands to be righted. Arendelle is not safe. The truth must be found. Without it, I see no future. No future? When one can see no future, all one can do is the next right thing. Future of Arendelle is at stake. Elsa has woken up these magical spirits and they're in danger, but they're, the spirits are angry because of something that has happened in the past. And Elsa and Anna don't know what that is, and so here begins the journey into the unknown of, of what, what's, what happened. And so that's sort of the, the premise of this whole deal, because they, they want to go figure out how to make things right, or else their country will suffer. You know, when, when normally, under normal circumstances, we as individuals, when we do something that we regret, we're the ones that have to try to make it right. But in this case, it's not an individual. It's, it's a whole country. And here, Elsa and Anna are the ones that are trying to, to make up for or figure out what to do that, to make up for this regrettable mistake that was done in the past, whatever it is. Individuals, it's easy to do, but when you're trying to do it for a whole country, that's a little, little bit different. But we see it happening all the time now. We, we, we have examples in our own country of, of leaders coming, coming, coming forward to try to make amends one way or the other for some past mistakes that either we as a country did, we as a society, or what, whatever, however you interpret that. The Pope just went to Canada this past week, and I don't know if you followed the story. It's, it was out there a little bit, and I read, I read a smidgen of it. But the Pope was trying to ask for forgiveness for the part that his church, that the Catholic Church had played long before he was bishop, uh, Pope, long before, most of it happened before he was even born. But they had 125 plus years of the church at the behest, truthfully, of Canada that went in, had these schools, and they pulled indigenous people from Canada into these schools and tried to really beat the culture out of them. 
because they forbade them to talk in their original language, their indigenous language, plus other atrocities that, that they starved them and other stuff like this. And most of those schools that they brought the indigenous people into were Catholic schools. And so obviously in the name of Jesus, they did all these things to try to make them good, good people and take the culture out of them. So, so the Pope acknowledged that we as a church made a mistake. And so he went on record numerous times during his tour in Canada. We see it some in our country. Probably see it, well, some of us probably see it more times than not where our country admits that we have made some bad mistakes in our history and our government has tried to do make amends on some form or fashion. It's just that sort of the nature of the, the culture we're living in right now. But, you know, Elsa and Anna's parents have died, so there's no way, they don't know, what's, they, they have no, no clue to what's going on that they can't hear, they don't, they don't know the stories. They, they have no history to look back on. They have no documentaries to watch or uh, a, they can't Google anything to try to find out what went on. So they have to go on this journey. And they go into this journey and they go into the Enchanted Forest. That's where this sort of whole deal starts. And, and once they get into that, things happen. They see the magic and they find out some secrets uh, that had happened, but in that moment, Elsa figures out that she has to keep going by herself because she is the only one that can really, truthfully, uncover these secrets and this big secret. And because memory, water has memory, she's able to find out. If you've not watched the movie, you have no idea what I mean when I say water has memory, right? So, so Elsa has to go on this journey, and when she goes, she finds out the truth and magically is able to send that truth back to Anna as well, and that happens in this scene. But they have given us no reason not to trust them. The North Uldra follow magic, which means we can never trust them. Grandfather? Magic makes people feel too powerful too entitled. It makes them think they can defy the will of a king. That is not what magic does. That's just your fear. Fear is what can't be trusted. You see, the dam will weaken their lands, so they will have to turn to me. They will come in celebration, and then we will know their size and strength. As you have welcomed us, we welcome you, our neighbors. Our friends. The dam isn't strengthening our waters. It's hurting the forest. It's cutting off the north. Let, let, let's not discuss this here. Let's meet on the fjord, have tea, find a solution. The dam will weaken their land, so they will have to turn to me. King Runa, the dam is hurting the forest. Elsa's found it. What is it? The truth about the past. That's my grandfather. Attacking the North Eldra leader. Who wields no weapon. So Anna's, uh, Elsa been able to find out the truth. That, that her grandfather was in on this um, deal to weaken the North Eldra people. By building the dam. And where they would make the North Eldra people dependent on them and not depending on Arendelle and not their magic. So that was the whole scheme behind building this dam, and then that leader uh, was killed by Elsa and Anna's grandfather. So that's the, that's the big secret. That's, that's what's out there. That's the, the regret that, that Arendelle's having to deal with, and that's why they're at risk, why their country is at risk, because of this, this thing that was, that was horrible. So, so Elsa has found out, but in finding out, it cost her. She's find, she finds out, but fortunately she's able to send a, a message back to her sister, but she is frozen, so she's out of the game. So she's no longer going to be able to help. And because she's frozen, and it's her magic that keeps the little snow guy, Olaf, alive, he's gone as well. So Anna is by herself. 
She is by herself, but she knows she's got to do something. She can't. She doesn't have a companion, Olaf, to go with her. She doesn't have uh, Elsa uh, with her anymore. They're gone. So, so what does she do? Well, she has to make a decision. And the only way she can make a decision, according to Disney, is to sing about it. So. I won't look too far ahead. It's too much for me to take. But break it down to this next breath, this next step, this next choice is one that I choice to hear that voice and do the next right thing. Now we pick it back a little bit off last week's message which was into the unknown. So when you're headed into the unknown, which Anna is now, what do you do? And she makes a determination that, well, I'm going to do the next right thing. Now, understand that she is, she's in grief right now. She, she is lonely right now, but she makes a decision to, to take a step and then another. She made a decision to do the next right thing. I, I love the, some of the lyrics in this song because it, it says this, you are lost, hope is gone, but you must go on and do the next right thing. Take a step, step again. It's all that I can do, the next right thing. I won't look too far ahead. Good chess players can do this. Good chess players can look at the board and, and plan way ahead, many, many moves way ahead. Kyle is not a good chess player. Can I, can I confess that to you? Because Kyle, when he plays chess, and it's been a long time since I've played chess, probably since high school or college or whatever, because I'd always lose. And here's why I would lose. Because when I put my finger on the pawn, and like the first move, I'd move it up two spaces, I keep my finger on that pawn, look all around the board, and go, oh, pawn is safe. I can lift my finger off. Because I knew pawn was safe for that next move. Or if I move my knight, two up and one over. Huh, I remember that. I put the knight, put my finger on my knight. I'm looking around the board, all around the board, and I see my knight is safe right now. Take my finger off. That's, that's about as good as I could do because I couldn't, I wasn't very good at looking three or four moves down the road. Therefore, I'd always lose chess. So that's why nobody ever plays with me because they can win in like five moves. I'm done. You know, it's a real quick chess match. Sometimes, though, when we look too far into the future, it can be stressful. We can't do it, but, but, but if we take this, the next step, do the next right thing, we take another step, we can manage that. And that's the way it is with, with our faith and trust in God that, that many times when we don't know way into the future, sometimes we just have to trust, we have to just take a step in faith and say, okay, God, I'm taking this step. I, no, I don't know what's five or 10 years down the road, but I'm gonna take this step right now as I trust you, as I have faith in you. Paul gives us some advice. I know you've been wondering, hey, is Kyle gonna ever talk about the Bible today? Or are we gonna look at Frozen? And I'm sure some of you go, I'd rather watch Frozen. But that's okay. We're not going to do that. We're going to look at the Bible. Because Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And, and see, I'm not too sure how many people are very careful with the way they live. I think sometimes we're a little more careless with the way we live. Because it sure seems to me like some of us are making decisions 
not based on what's best for us, but we're making decisions on what other people are doing. See, I, I see us as, as a number of people making decisions because, hey, friend A, B, and C are doing C, D, and E with their children, so I want to do C, D, and E, and we make those decisions that way. We, we, we more re, are more reactionary when it pertains to decisions in our lives reacting to what somebody else is doing rather than what's the wisest thing for me to do in my family. We look at other people. Or, or we, we literally make decisions totally based on our kids because we think our kids got to do this and that after school every day, and so we're going here, there, and everywhere, taking them different places, and it, and it has nothing to do with us. It's, we think we can get them better. We think that we can get them stronger. We can get them faster. What is that? That's six million dollar man. Just a second. We we think they can advance or be smarter or whatever. And so we we react and make choices based on that. Are they the wisest choices? I guess that's the question that that we want to ask ourselves. Which which is the wise choice to make? You know, sometimes we make decisions that, that are on the edge. And, and on the edge, I mean, like, they, they go right up to the edge of morally wrong. They go right up to the edge of ethically wrong. They go right up to the edge of legally wrong. But we don't go across them. And we think because we don't cross that line that we're Okay. But that may not be the wisest choice. Sometimes we make decisions because our culture, our world says it's okay. That our culture, our world will will not say anything about it because it's fine according to our culture and our world. So I'll give you a heads up. Some of you might want to pick your feet up off the floor because I'm really going to step on some toes. In our culture, cohabitation is the norm. Cohabitation is the norm. It, it is an anomaly whenever I meet with a couple that are already, that, that are living separately. It is not the norm these days. Because culture has come up with the idea that this is a good test for marriage. Every study that I've read, every documentation I have said it is not. It is not a good test for marriage. I'm not going to go into the details of that. I will later, but not in this venue. Also, culture says it's okay. It's encouraged to be intimate before people get married. That's the norm. That's what everybody is doing. There's nothing wrong with that. Culture says that's okay. But I tend to be an old school guy that looks at the Bible and goes, that's not what God says. And for generations and generations, God has said, let's do it this way. Because if you do it my way, it actually works out better. All right? So what's the wise thing to do? You see, nobody's going nobody's to jump on you. Nobody's going kick to you, kick you in the face. Nobody's going to uh, scroll your name out on Facebook or whatever because of, of doing some of these things that culture says is okay. But is it the wise thing to do? Is it the wise thing to do? That's the question that I want you to ask because the next right thing for all of us should be the wise thing. I love what Gandhi says, you may never know what results come of your actions, but if you do nothing, there will be no results. You see, if if, if you're in in a place where you're, like an honest case, where she was like in a cave and and she was all alone and she was wallowing in grief, maybe in self-pity, if she did nothing, nothing there would be no results at all. And if we do nothing, there's no results, but if we take a step, there's a chance. 
there's a chance that something good can happen. I think most of us, vast majority of us, understand that when we make a mistake, when we've made a mistake in the past, most of us have, have learned from it. And, and we've learned eno- enough not to do it again. So I want to think about two questions today. The first one is, according to what's going on in my life right now, what's the wise thing to do? According to what's going on in my life right now, the season that you're in right now, and there's a lot of different seasons here, right? We have the season where we have young children, the infants and, and preschoolers. We have other, others in here that are getting ready to be empty nesters. We got others that are, that are actually raising grandkids. So we have a lot of different seasons here represented in the sanctuary and in probably those watching online as well. What, what about now? In right now, in this moment, what is the wise thing to do? Jesus says, you know what? There's enough worries today. You, you're going to have enough worry for today. But here's what happens to some of us. We let the worries of the day, which is the fear that comes in. We, we let the circumstances of the day, we let the, the pressure of the day really force us into making a decision that is reactionary and not a decision based on the wise thing to do. Most of us, when we have a knee-jerk reaction to something, regret it. Very few times when we have a knee-jerk reaction, we go, yeah, that was the right response. Most of us, in the heat of the moment, will say something or do something that we regret. But if we cool off just 24 hours, normally we make a better decision. So when you think about this the season right here, right now, you know, in the, the season we're in it. Let's just take the stock market right now, right? So there's some of us here that are way on up in years where we can't take much of a risk in the stock market. But if we're younger, hey, things, things may be a good place to invest in a buyer or whatever. So younger you are, you have more time and to take a risk. So you have to make a decision, make the wise choice on where you are in this season of life. And understand that the wise choice today may not be the wise choice in five months. The wise choice uh, in five months may be idiotic to make today. So you have to understand where you are right now and make a decision. To make a decision based on now. Not, not make a decision on, okay, yeah, it's, it's legal, it's permissible, maybe it's practical. No, don't make a decision. Make a decision on what's the wise thing to do. What's the wise thing to do? Not just, oh, it's legal to do it. That's, that's a cop-out. Everybody else is doing it. That's a cop-out. What is the wise thing to do in this moment? And the other question I want you to think about is, as I think about my future, as I think about my dreams, what's the wise thing to do? As I think about my future, as I think about my dreams, what is the wise thing to do? How many people here live in their dream? How many people here, most of us are not, quote unquote, living the dreams, particularly the dreams we had when we, were, when we were younger. I dreamt of Major League Baseball. Nope, dreams were dashed pretty quickly. You know, when, when they DH for you in high school, probably not going to be a chance that you're going to play Major League Baseball, right? So most of our dreams don't come true. Really, most of our dreams do not come true. But many of our dreams are dashed because of decisions we make that impact our future. You see, when we start making unwise decisions, now it actually impacts our future. It does, it it, it will impact our future. (coughs) And I thought about this, truthfully. I did think about this when, when I was in high school. Believe it or not, I was able to think a little bit into the future. And and this pertains to dating. In high school and then my first year of college, I dated a girl named Karen, a girl named Waverly, 
and a girl named Sandy. And yes, I'm, I'm confessing, I dated a Karen, all right? I dated a Karen. So I'm, I hadn't checked lately. She may have changed her name by now. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, I actually thought about this when I was dating uh, those, those young ladies because here's what I thought. Would I introduce Karen, Waverly, and Sandy to the future Mrs. Gatlin? Would I be willing to introduce them? And as I look back on all those relationships, because those are the ones I had the longest, truthfully, um, the answer was yes. Because I knew somewhere down the road I would be, I would be married. I didn't, didn't know her name, didn't know when it was going to happen, but I knew it was going to happen at some point. And I don't remember exactly the year, but Deandra, my wife now, we were either seriously dating or engaged. I can't remember when. But when she came to my hometown with me one year, we actually, we and then uh, my best friend from high school, Ben, actually went to see Waverly. And here's the reason we went to see Waverly. Um, Waverly had, was a double liver transplant, and, and we knew things weren't, weren't getting any better for her, truthfully, so, so we went to see her. And so my wife met Waverly. We had a conversation with Waverly. She died a couple years after that uh, from, from liver failure. So what are you doing now that will impact your future? We do it all the time. We, we leverage our future based on things we do today. And the easiest thing that I can give you an example of is, is finances. We, we leverage our future so we can get what we want today. Happens all the time. Our country's in, in major debt. Yes, I know our government is, but I mean, individual consumer debt, we're in major debt because we, we want what we want when we, when we want it, but we leverage our future because we're not making a wise choice. We're not making a wise choice. One of the things that, that I realized really in the last couple weeks is that Hayes McKay made decisions for the future. And I only can say that in our relationship that he and I had together. That he made, our, he made decisions with me and for me to keep me here at this church rather than for me to go to another church. He made the decision at that moment because he was looking to a day when he would no longer be here. He was looking to the future. And he made the decisions then to keep me here on staff because he was looking toward the future. It's never too late to start thinking about our tomorrows. We believe we got plenty of tomorrows coming. We hope we have many tomorrows coming, so we need to be thinking about those. And the decisions we make now will impact those future decisions based on the future hopes and dreams, my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? The rest of the Ephesians passage, notice this. Make the most of every opportunity. Why do we need to make a wise choice? Why don't we even think about making a wise choice? Because we need to make the most of every opportunity. Some of our opportunities to impact our families, to impact our world, to impact another person's life for the better, some of those opportunities don't come along every day. So we need to make the most of every opportunity and make the wise choice. We don't have, we don't have every day an opportunity to make a difference in a child's life. For eternity. We don't have those opportunities every day. So we want to make the most of every opportunity and make the wise choice so a difference can be made in a child's life, in a friend's life, in a neighbor's life, in some, just a stranger's life. An opportunity for eternal difference. Why do we need to make the most of every opportunity? Because the days are evil. Are the days we're living in are evil. Paul said it years ago, but guess what? This could easily be sitting, 
said right now in today's world. And, and let me tell you how I, there's a lot of different ways to talk about evil. But I'm going to just put it in terms of the church world just in the context of today. All right? Because here's the deal. People that follow God's word, people that believe in Jesus Christ as the only way to God and the only way to be in heaven, are in the minority. And any, anybody that says and comes against us for our biblical stance, I would say that would be evil coming in our face. The world wouldn't say it's evil. The world would just say it's a choice. Okay? But if, it, but if you have good and evil, and that's all you have, and if good is God's word, and somebody's coming against God's word, that's, that's where I get the evil from. Okay? So, so I mean it in that context. And I want to tell you, and it's becoming truer and truer as I get older. The more a person stands up for biblical truth and, and uh, living a God-honoring way, the more they'll be made fun of, the more they'll be roasted on social media and everywhere else. That's why we need to make the wise choice. Not the popular choice, not the choice that's going to make us get a, a lot of likes on social media, not a lot, a, a lot of shares on Facebook. No, we make the wise choice. We make the wise choice. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So Paul ends with this, understanding what the Lord's will is. I, I'm not sure all of us will understand what the Lord's will is for our entire life. So here, how about this? Let's just get it down to God. What is your will for my next step? In my next. You know, when, when I was serving in Montgomery at a church in 97, I had no idea God's will for me would be to be in Dothan. So I, so I just lived... God's will for me at that time, live in Montgomery, take it a step at a time. Take it a step at a time. Make the wise choice one step at a time. And understand what God's will is then for that moment. And let God show you what his will is for the next step and the next step. These 31 days of prayer that we want to encourage you to be a part of, that's what I want your prayer to be. To understand what God's will is for you first. To understand what God's will is for this church, this congregation. So that we will take the next, make the next right choice. So we do the next right thing. Because we want to be in God's will. We want to make the most of every opportunity. And we want to be a church made up of people who do the next right thing and make the wise choice. Let's pray. God, in these moments, in, in this difficult time in our world, we are divided as a country, and gosh, we are, we're even divided as a denomination. So it's got to help us. Help us to make wise choice, to do the next right thing and make the wise choice for, for this season in life, but also for our future. Help us understand what your will is. Understand what your will is for my life, for my family's life, for, for this church. Just, just come and let us know. Show us as we take the next step. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I do want to encourage you to find a prayer partner or two or three. Pray about this. 
with our digital um, prayer guide. It should be available. If you've not have access to it, it's on, our, on the website. You should be able to find it. It's usually connected with the message somewhere, so you can click on it through the digital prayer guide. And that prayer starts tomorrow, August 1st, 31 days of prayer. Thank you so much for praying.